In this video, I'm going to review what alveolar and systemic gas exchange are, and I'll talk about the mechanisms that drive the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide during alveolar and systemic gas exchange. Before we talk about where alveolar and systemic gas exchange occurs in the body, let's do a quick review of the structures of the respiratory system. So one of the main functions of the respiratory system is to bring air into our body and to our gas exchange surfaces. So here you can see the nose and the mouth are two ways that we bring air into the body. The air then travels down through this tube called the pharynx. That leads to the larynx, which is our voice box. The air then travels down the windpipe, or in other words, the trachea, and then the air goes into each one of our lungs. We have a right lung and a left lung. The main airways that bring the air to our lungs is called the bronchi, singular bronchus. So those are the larger tubes here. And then the bronchi branch into even smaller air passageways called the bronchioles. The bronchioles eventually lead to these tiny little air sacs called the alveoli. So here on the right, you can see a close up of a single bronchiole. And then all these little air sacs that you see are the alveoli, and that's where alveolar gas exchange occurs. So some of the alveoli are present by themselves along the wall of the bronchioles or other tubes called the alveolar ducts. And then other alveoli are clustered in these large clusters or sacs at the end of the bronchioles. And you can see that around all the alveoli, we have these pulmonary capillaries filled with blood. And so this is how oxygen is able to leave the air that we breathe in and enter our blood. And this is where we can get rid of carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is going to leave our blood and enter the alveoli and then make its way out through these tubes when we exhale. Okay, so this is a schematic showing the circulatory system. And it's important to also understand how blood flows through our body to understand how oxygen is making its way to all of our tissue cells. Now, each cell in our body requires oxygen for cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is a chemical process where six molecules of oxygen and one molecule of glucose are converted into six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. This carbon dioxide is a waste product that we get rid of through exhaling. So why do we need to break down glucose? Well, glucose, this molecule, this sugar molecule, stores a lot of energy. And when we break down glucose, we can use the energy that's released to make another form of chemical energy known as ATP. So for every molecule of glucose that is broken down through cellular respiration, a maximum of about 38 ATP molecules can be made. Our cells cannot use the energy stored in glucose directly to do anything. Instead, the energy that's stored in glucose must be converted to ATP, and then the energy that's stored in each ATP molecule can be used for things such as muscle contractions, to drive the movement of molecules across the cell membrane, as well as to provide the right amount of energy for specific chemical reactions that might happen within each cell. So ATP, again, is necessary for cellular function. Cells cannot do anything unless ATP is present. So now let's look at how oxygen gets from the air into our blood, and then how oxygen gets from our blood into our tissue cells. Okay, so here you can see the movement of oxygen into the blood comes from the lungs. Okay, so here's the right lung and the left lung over here on this side. And remember, the little air sacs where gas exchange is happening in the lungs is called the alveoli. So between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries, that's where our blood becomes oxygenated. Oxygen enters the pulmonary capillaries and carbon dioxide leaves our blood, enters our lungs so that we can exhale that waste product. This process where oxygen enters our blood and carbon dioxide leaves our blood and enters our lungs is called alveolar gas exchange. Once the blood becomes oxygenated, now it's oxygen rich, that blood will travel through our pulmonary veins and eventually enter the left side of our heart. 
Okay, so you can see that over here as well. So it's going to enter the upper chamber of our heart on the left side, and then that blood's going to move to our lower chamber of our heart. And you can see that our oxygenated blood and our deoxygenated blood or oxygen poor blood is kept separate in our bodies. So the left side of our heart always has that oxygen rich blood. The right side of our heart will always contain the oxygen poor blood. So the left ventricle or the lower chamber of the heart will then contract and pump that blood to all of our tissue cells. So that blood will be pumped through our largest artery known as the aorta. The aorta has several branches that help to deliver that blood or disperse it throughout our body. So these smaller arteries branching off of the aorta are called the systemic arteries. Some of them will supply oxygen-rich blood to the tissue cells in the upper part of the body, and some of those branches off of the aorta will supply oxygen-rich blood to the tissue cells in the lower part of our body. So where oxygen leaves our blood and enters our tissue cells is called the systemic capillaries. So these are tiny capillaries that surround your tissue cells. And from the systemic capillaries, oxygen is going to diffuse out of those into our interstitial fluid or our tissue fluid out here, and then into our tissue cells. You can see the same thing happens in the lower part of the body. And since our tissue cells are taking in oxygen, right, also taking in glucose, and they're producing carbon dioxide as a waste product, our tissue cells are constantly making CO2. So that CO2 is then going to diffuse out of our tissue cells and into our blood at the systemic capillaries. The blood leaving our systemic capillaries is very oxygen poor because most of that oxygen has left and entered our tissue cells. That oxygen poor blood is then going to be returned to the right side of our heart. And you can see that from the bottom part of our body as well. That blood will flow into our lower chamber of the right side of our heart. And then when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to pump that blood back to our lungs so that it can be reoxygenated. So as you can see, gas exchange is when gases diffuse across membranes within our body. So either from the lungs into the pulmonary capillaries or in the opposite direction. And then also between the systemic capillaries and our tissue cells. So we have two different types of gas exchange that are really important in bringing oxygen into our blood and then delivering that oxygen to our tissue cells. These two types of gas exchange are also really important in removing carbon dioxide from our body. So this is how carbon dioxide moves from our tissue cells into our blood and then from our blood into our lungs so that we can get rid of it. The first is alveolar gas exchange, and that is the movement of carbon dioxide and oxygen between the alveoli in the lungs and the blood in the pulmonary capillaries. And then we have systemic gas exchange, which is the movement of carbon dioxide and oxygen between the blood in the systemic capillaries and the tissue cells of the body. Now you see this word diffusion used a lot when we talk about the movement of gases or even the movements of solutes in your body. And diffusion is defined as the movement of a solute, such as a gas, from an area with a higher concentration to an area with a lower concentration. This is just the natural way that molecules want to move. Diffusion is a passive process, okay? So it doesn't require energy. Naturally, molecules or solutes, in other words, will want to move from an area where there's more of it to an area where there's less of it. And they'll continue moving until there's an equilibrium between the two areas. So now let's look at what drives alveolar and systemic gas exchange. So why is oxygen move one way and carbon dioxide move the other way? Okay, this has to do with what we call the partial pressure gradient of a gas. The amount of a gas is usually measured as the partial pressure of that gas. So instead of saying the concentration of a gas, we usually describe the amount of a gas in a mixture as its partial pressure. So the partial pressure of a gas, which is represented as P subscript, whatever the name of the gas is. So for example, you can see here the partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the air in your alveoli of your lungs is about 40 millimeters of mercury. So the partial pressure of a gas can be described as the pressure an individual gas contributes towards the total pressure of a mixture of gases. So here you can see the total pressure of the mixture of gases within your lungs is 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. Okay, so at sea level, 
the total atmospheric pressure is 760, so the total pressure within your lungs is about 70, 760. And you can see here, for example, that within your lungs, 13% of that air is oxygen. Okay, so if we take 13.7% of 760, that gives us 104 millimeters of mercury. So oxygen contributes 104 millimeters of mercury to the total pressure of the gas mixture within your lungs. And as you can see here, most of the gas that you breathe in and most of the gas, therefore, that's in your lungs is actually nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up about 75% of the gas mixtures inside your lungs. However, nitrogen is not very soluble in your blood, so very little nitrogen will actually enter your blood. So let's look at how we define the total pressure of a gas mixture. The total pressure of a gas mixture is the sum of all the partial pressures of the gases in that mixture. So we can add up all the partial pressures of each gas that's in the air, and that will give us the total pressure of the air. And another thing that's really important to emphasize, and I'll talk about this more later, is that the direction and the rate of diffusion of a gas depends on its partial pressure gradient. So what I mean by partial pressure gradient, this is the difference in the partial pressure of a gas in two different areas. So the greater that difference in partial pressure, the greater the rate of diffusion. And remember, gases always diffuse down their pressure gradient from an area where there's a higher partial pressure to an area where there's a lower partial pressure. So let's summarize some of the important factors that drive gas exchange and then look at how that specifically relates to alveolar and systemic gas exchange. So first off, remember, gases always diffuse down the partial pressure gradient. So this is why oxygen is going to move one way and carbon dioxide is going to move the opposite way when we look at gas exchange occurring. So here on the left, we can see a close-up of what's happening during alveolar gas exchange. Sometimes this is also referred to as external respiration. So that's going to be happening between the air in the alveoli of the lungs and the blood in our pulmonary capillaries. Over here on the right, you can see what's happening during systemic gas exchange, and that is also known as internal respiration. Remember, that's going to be happening between our tissue cells and the blood in the systemic capillaries. So the blood that's entering our pulmonary capillaries is very oxygen poor, okay? So it's gonna have a low partial pressure of oxygen of about 40. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is actually gonna be about 45, okay? And if we look at the air within our lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen is relatively high here. So it's about 104 millimeters of mercury. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is about 40 millimeters of mercury. So as you can see, if oxygen were to diffuse down its partial pressure gradient, it's going to go from 104 to the area where there's less of it, which would be 40, which would be in the blood. So oxygen is going to diffuse from the alveoli into the blood. Now carbon dioxide is going to go the other direction because its partial pressure in the blood is 45 and its partial pressure in the air in the alveoli is only 40. So it's going to also go down its gradient, but that's going to move it in the opposite direction. Now, gases will continue to diffuse until there is an equilibrium. Now, oxygen is going to continue diffusing into the blood until the partial pressure of oxygen within the blood equals that of the partial pressure of oxygen in the air in the alveoli. So it's going to keep on coming into the blood until the partial pressure of oxygen within the blood is about 104, so about the same as in the air. Carbon dioxide is going to keep on leaving the blood until the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood also equals that within the air of the alveoli. So it's going to keep leaving until the partial pressure of carbon dioxide drops to 40. Now our blood here is very oxygenated. And that oxygenated blood can make its way to our systemic capillaries through our circulatory system. So now we see this oxygen-rich blood entering our systemic capillaries. Oxygen is going to want to again diffuse down its partial pressure gradient. You can see that the partial pressure of oxygen within our tissue cells is usually less than or equal to 40. So again, every, it depends on how much cellular respiration is happening within a specific tissue cell. If a tissue cell is doing a lot of cellular respiration, then it's going to use up more oxygen. So its partial pressure of oxygen will be even lower. Also, Remember, during cellular respiration, carbon dioxide is made. So if a cell 
is undergoing a lot of cellular respiration, it's going to be making a lot of carbon dioxide. So its partial pressure of carbon dioxide can be greater than usually or equal to about 45. All right, so these numbers can vary depending on the tissue cells or the type of tissue you're looking at. Anyway, so what's driving the movement of oxygen into the tissue cells? Well, that is the partial pressure gradient here. So oxygen diffuses from the blood into the tissue cells and carbon dioxide is also going to move down its partial pressure gradient, but it's going to be leaving the tissue cells, crossing that interstitial fluid and entering the blood in our systemic capillaries. And oxygen and carbon dioxide will continue diffusing and moving either in or out of the blood until there's an equilibrium, until the partial pressure of oxygen within the blood is equal to that within the tissue cells. So oxygen will keep on leaving the blood until the partial pressure of oxygen drops to about 40. That's whatever it is in the tissue cells. And then in the case of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is going to leave the tissue cells and enter the blood, causing the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood to increase until the partial pressure is equal to whatever it is in the tissue cells. So in this case, it would be about 45. So now that blood is oxygen poor, and you can see that that oxygen poor blood will eventually come to the pulmonary capillaries where it can be reoxygenated again. So the blood leaving the systemic capillaries will eventually make its way into the pulmonary capillaries. So you can see the numbers here on the left match the numbers here on the right. We can even take these numbers and put them into this diagram here. So I know there's a lot here, but let's just focus on the partial pressures of the gases. Let's start here with alveolar gas exchange, just like we did in that last image. So here you can see the oxygen poor blood has a low partial pressure of oxygen, a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Well, because of the partial pressure differences here, you can see that oxygen is going to move into the blood in the pulmonary capillaries from where it's 104 to where it's 40. And it's going to keep on entering the blood until the partial pressure of oxygen increases to 104. Since the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is higher in the blood in the pulmonary capillaries, the carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood, enter the lungs, and it's going to keep doing that until the partial pressure of carbon dioxide drops to 40, equal to what it was on the other side. Now that oxygen-rich blood is going to enter our left side of the heart, it's going to get pumped out through the aorta. It's going to either go to the upper part or lower part of our body. Up here at the upper part of our body, where it's going to these tissue cells up here, you can see that oxygen is going to be driven out of the blood because the partial pressure of oxygen is so low in our tissue cells. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is going to leave the tissue cells and enter our blood. And you can see that the blood leaving our systemic capillaries has a low partial pressure of oxygen because it's deoxygenated and has a higher partial pressure of carbon dioxide because of all that carbon dioxide that diffuse out of our tissue cells and into our blood. All right, now see if you can answer these review questions here. Number one, during alveolar gas exchange, oxygen blanks the blood. Oxygen should enter the blood during alveolar gas exchange. That's how our blood becomes oxygenated, right? And what's driving that is it's moving down its partial pressure gradient. Number two, during systemic gas exchange, oxygen blanks the blood. Oxygen exits the blood because it's leaving on the blood to go to our tissue cells. Number three, if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in a tissue cell is 48 millimeters of mercury, then the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood at the venous end of the systemic capillaries would be, the correct answer here would be about 48 millimeters of mercury. And that's because carbon dioxide is going to keep on leaving the tissue cells and entering the systemic capillaries until the partial pressure in the blood is about equal to that of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the tissue cells. Okay, now let's look at our second really important point here. The steeper the partial pressure gradient for a gas, the faster it diffuses. Okay, so the greater the difference in that partial pressure gradient, the faster that gas can diffuse in. So let's look at the difference in the partial pressure gradient of oxygen at sea level versus at high altitudes, such as on top of the Mount Kilimanjaro, which is 5,895 meters high. So you can see here that the total atmospheric pressure at sea level is 760, 
But as you go higher in elevation or higher in altitude, the atmospheric pressure decreases because the air is less dense. So on top of Kilimanjaro at this high altitude, the total atmospheric pressure is about half of that at what it is at sea level. So it's about 379 millimeters of mercury. Okay, because it's about half, the partial pressure of oxygen is about half. Okay, so it's 52 instead of 104. All right, so look at the partial pressure gradient that we see over here at sea level. The difference is about 64. So that's going to, you know, drive the oxygen into the blood relatively fast. If you look over here at high altitude, the partial pressure gradient or the difference is only about 12. So oxygen is going to diffuse a lot slower into the blood. So at higher altitudes, it's much harder for your blood to take up oxygen when you're breathing. Okay, again, the greater partial pressure difference means a faster rate of diffusion. So let's look at the rate of diffusion of carbon dioxide at sea level versus high altitudes. So again, because the atmospheric pressure is half at on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is also halved. So it's about 40 millimeters of mercury at sea level, and then it's 20 millimeters of mercury at a high altitude. So remember, carbon dioxide is diffusing out of the blood into the lungs, and it's at sea level. You can see that it's going from an area where it's 45 to 40. Okay, whereas at a high altitude, it's going from the pulmonary capillaries where it's 45 to where it's 20. So it's going to diffuse even faster out of the blood. Okay, because here you can see that the greater partial pressure gradient means a faster rate of diffusion. And then finally, another really important point that we haven't looked at yet that drives gas exchange is the solubility of a gas. So the more soluble a gas is in the blood, the faster it will be able to diffuse in or out of the blood. So solubility, that term refers to the ability of a solute such as a gas to diffuse or mix with a liquid. Carbon dioxide, it's important to, it's important to note that carbon dioxide is more soluble than oxygen in the blood. Therefore, carbon dioxide can diffuse faster and needs less of a pressure gradient to drive its diffusion. Okay, and you can see that here again, carbon dioxide is more soluble than oxygen in the blood, so it can mix with the blood a lot easier. So in order to move oxygen and carbon dioxide, notice that oxygen has a really large partial pressure gradient, a difference of 64 to drive it into or out of the blood. Whereas carbon dioxide, it only has a partial pressure gradient of about five. So it doesn't need a huge difference in order to drive its movement. So oxygen, therefore, because of its lower solubility, it needs a higher partial pressure gradient for sufficient diffusion to occur. One last thing I want to touch on in this review is a difference between the composition of our inspired air, or in other words, the air we breathe in, and the air that's actually in the alveoli or actually within the air sacs within our lungs. So there is a difference in this composition. You can see that here looking at these two images side by side here. So notice the total pressure is going to be the same or relatively similar between the inspired air and the alveolar air. The total pressure is mostly going to be affected by your elevation or your altitude. So if you're at sea level, the total pressure is going to be around 760 in the inspired air as well as the alveolar air. So let's look at the difference in the composition between the inspired air and alveolar air. Air in the alveoli, as you can see in this diagram here, has more CO2. Okay, CO2 only makes up about 0.04% of the gases in the air that you breathe in. However, in our alveoli, it makes up about 5% of the air within our lungs. So the amount of carbon dioxide increases. There's less oxygen within our lungs than what's in the air. So in the air, the air you're breathing in, it's about 21% oxygen, but in your lungs, the air mixture is there. It, oxygen only makes up about 13.7% of the air. The reason that air gains carbon dioxide when you breathe it in and the amount of oxygen goes down 
due to the fact that inspired air, so the air that you're breathing in, is actually mixing with carbon dioxide rich residual air in your lungs. So there's always a little bit of air that's in your lungs when you breathe in, that's kind of just stuck in your lungs, okay? Because whenever you breathe out, if you were to just exhale as much as possible and try to breathe all the air out of your lungs, you cannot. There's actually a little bit of residual air that's always going to remain in your lungs even after the most forceful exhale. Also notice that the alveolar air contains more water vapor than the inspired air. Alveolar air has about is made up of about 6.2% water vapor, whereas the inspired air is only about 0.5%. This is due to the fact that inspired air is being humidified by the mucous membranes in the airways. So that's going to add water vapor to the air. 